Welcome back, everybody. We're on to Chapter 6, which is Reproduction at the Cellular Level in our Concepts of Biology textbook. During this lecture, we'll be looking at the first three sections, 6.1, the genome, 6.2, the cell cycle, and 6.3, cancer and the cell cycle. And our textbook gives us some pictures to get us warmed up to the idea of cellular reproduction by looking at how a sea urchin begins its life as a single cell that divides into two and then divides more and more by a process called mitosis as seen by scanning electron microscopy here in the pictures which we studied earlier in the course. And then at the very end of it, in picture C, we see how it has developed into a complex multicellular organism, the mature sea urchin. Our objectives for section one, the genome, is to describe the prokaryote and eukaryote genome and distinguish between three things, chromosomes, genes, and traits. But let's start off by asking ourselves, why do cells need to divide in the first place? Well, obviously for reproduction, it's what your cells have been doing ever since the sperm fertilized the egg that made you. When cells make a copy of their DNA, which is what's called the genome, and then they divide by mitosis, that's a form of asexual reproduction. And one-celled creatures also do that. They make a copy of their genome, their complete set of DNA, and then they divide in two, another form of asexual reproduction. But in single-celled organism, it's, all, it's mostly called binary fission when that happens. You'll also have cells make more of themselves for growth, which is what you had to do ever since the sperm fertilized the egg and made you, and you had to grow into an adult, your cells constantly had to go through mitosis or cell division in order to grow from the single cell to an adult organism, which, by the way, is a multi-celled organism. That is you. And then repair and renewal. So for instance, your skin cells, the top layer of your skin is basically dead cells. So you have to constantly replace that outermost layer by mitosis, so those lower le level skin cells constantly go through mitosis to be able to keep replacing that dead layer that falls off on top. Your stomach cells are another great example that are constantly going through mitosis to make more cells. They have to replace themselves quite often, at least every two weeks or so, because of that acid that's in the stomach that could easily destroy them. So there we have it, reproduction for growth, repair, and renewal. So what's actually passed on during reproduction? Well, when a cell divides, whether it be by mitosis in a multi-celled organism or binary fission in a single-celled organism, you pass on those cell structures and organelles, if you're a eukaryote, you have those organelles to pass on as well, such as mitochondria, Golgi, ER, the cytoplasm, even prokaryotes pass on their cytoplasm, or even uh, ribosomes, there will be some of those that get passed on as well. And then, of course, the genome, the entire complement of double-stranded DNA in the cell. That DNA is the instructions for the cell to make all the proteins and some other things that it needs, such as RNA as well. So that genome gets passed down. With some differences here, if you're a single-celled organism or a cell going through mitosis, then you pass on 100% of that genome. But there's another type of cell division in a sexually reproducing organism. It's called meiosis, where you only get to pass on half of your genome, but we'll talk about that in our next chapter coming up. But it's very important to be able to pass on that genome to your offspring because that's going to tell cells in the future how to make things that the cells are going to need to survive. So uh, in each cells, our DNA is the molecule that's organized as what's called chromosomes. 
So chromosomes are basically strands of DNA that are wrapped around these proteins, which are called histones. And basically it makes the DNA easier to work with because DNA is long and stringy and long-stranded. It makes it easier for the cell to work with and organize during cell division. So I kind of like to think of it like spaghetti. That DNA is like spaghetti and the proteins called histones are like the meatballs and if you can wrap your spaghetti around the meatball uh, then you get both in each bite, right? Uh, but it makes it much more easier for your cell to handle when it's trying to divide in two and make sure that each daughter cell is going to get what it needs get a full copy of the genome all right so that the chromosomes then carry our cells genetic information and if you're a eukaryotic organism like us we have linear chromosomes in fact as humans we have 46 of them in the nuclei of our cells and they come in long strands that are tightly wound around proteins we have 46 of those but if you're a prokaryote then remember there's no nucleus to put your chromosomes in so they have that nucleoid region of the cytoplasm where they have a singular circular chromosome or a chromosome that's like a ring and then different organisms that are eukaryotes are going to have different numbers of chromosomes as well some prokaryotes as a little side note besides having their main circular chromosome with millions of DNA base pairs they also have these smaller rings of DNA called plasmids that contain other genes that are not quite essential for life but are usually genes that are nice to have such as a bacteria can pass its plasmid onto another bacteria and possibly that plasmid might have a gene in it to resist certain antibiotics now that's something that we wouldn't like but the bacteria sure like it because it gives them that extra edge so each species has a characteristic chromosome number as I said the eukaryotic DNA is divided among a number of chromosomes that differ in length and shape humans have 46 of them and uh, if I remember right fruit flies have eight just off the top of my head and chimpanzees I think it's 48 but uh, scientists know and you can look that up if you're interested in an organism and want to know how many chromosomes it has uh, then you can look that up and I'm sure you can probably find that in a number of places or by googling it so the sum of all the chromosomes in a cell is its chromosome number so for us that would be 46 so our uh, regular body cells are what we call uh, somatic cells they're they're also described as being diploid die that prefix means two so that means we have two of each type of chromosome so basically we divide our 46 chromosomes into 23 pair because 23 of them come from our mom and 23 come from our dad and we actually number them believe it or not a scientist uh, once took a picture of our chromosomes and they uh, lined them up in pairs and they did it by size that here's the longest pair of chromosomes we're going to call that chromosome pair number one and then there's pair number two are the next largest pair number three all the way down to the 23rd pair which is what we call the X and the Y if you're a female you have two X's for the 23rd pair those are your sex chromosomes and if you're a male you have an X and a Y so uh, all of your cells regular body or somatic cells are diploid cells meaning they have both copies of those uh, chromosomes a maternal and a paternal chromosome of each type your gametes which are your sex cells or your sperm or your egg are a different story we describe those as being haploid cells and they go through a special cell division process where they divide twice to get the number of chromosomes down to half or just the 23 so they have just one of each so they only have one number one one number two 
one number three all the way down to the 23rd one, and they're either going to have an X or a Y, which if you're a male, you have both X and Y, and then you can determine the sex of your child. Uh, the females will only have uh, the X on the end there for the 23rd one. But those are haploid cells. Haploid basically means you have half the chromosomes, and those are just the sperm and the egg which are gametes, and those are made in the testes and the ovaries. But the rest of all of our cells are diploid cells and should have two copies of each chromosome. And my cat has come into my screen, so I've got to move her out of the way. All right. So our chromosome number in our somatic or diploid cells is 46, and we describe that as being 2n. The n is our haploid number, which is 23. So 2 times 23 is 46. And that's what we find in our diploid cells. Our haploid cells only have n, which is the 23. All right, and so then as I described, having a chromosome from your mom and your dad of each type, a maternal and a paternal chromosome, we call each of those homologous. So let's say that in the picture here we have a, a representation of two chromosomes. One is blue, one is pink. We'll say the blue one came from dad, the pink one came from mom. This would be a homologous pair. Let's say it's pair number one. And so we would find the same genes on each of these chromosomes. So let's say the gene for blood type is on chromosome number one. I, I actually don't know off the top of my head which chromosome our, our ABO blood type is on, but we'll just say it's on this pair right here that we're looking at on the screen. The cat's tail there again. All right. So uh, let's say that dad's has the gene for the type A blood, but mom's Although she has that uh, same gene for blood type, which is a nucleotide sequence. Uh, let's say hers is a little bit different version, a little bit different sequence of DNA, and it's the B version instead. So we would call those different versions of genes alleles. So dad's got the blood type version B, mom has the blood type version A. So together, what would that make your blood type? It would be AB, but we'll be looking at that uh, in further chapters, which is some very interesting stuff. So these are homologous chromosomes. So pair number one is homologous. Pair number two is homologous on down. Uh, for pair number 23, the sex chromosomes, though, two Xs are homologous if mom gives you an X and dad gives you an X. But if it's an X and a Y and you're a male, that's the exception to the rule. Those are the only pair that are not homologous. The X and the Y have totally different genes on them. The Y actually only has about 30 or, l or less genes. The Y, very small chromosome. The X is a nice big long chromosome with uh, hundreds or thousands of genes on it. So here's our chromosome, pair number one, homologous pair. Uh, before a cell is ready to divide, these chromosomes have to duplicate. And so this, in the after the arrow, after DNA replication, this is what duplicated chromosomes look like when they are going to be ready to divide. And you can see they're held together by what's called a centromere. It's a bunch of proteins that holds them together. And that's where they're going to be pulled apart during cell division so that each new daughter cell gets a copy. So these chromos so this whole thing is called a chromosome. Each side is called a chromatid, and because they're duplicates of each other, these are called sister chromatids. So on dad's chromosome here, it's got the sister chromatids labeled. Mom's over here, uh, hers is also duplicated and has sister chromatids. So these will be pulled apart during cell division. And here's a picture of what's called a karyotype. Kind of a little bit different picture here with the chromosomes are actually colored, but we can at least see that for each number, there's a pair. 
One's maternal, one's paternal. I can't tell by just looking at it which is which, but scientists have actually uh, been able to tell out of like number one here which one is from mom and which one is from dad. So they can actually do that now, which is pretty neat. And then we can see that they are lined up by size. The big ones are number one, two, three, and then our small ones, 19, 20, 21, and 22, very small chromosomes. And then the X is kind of out of place here. This is actually a female because there's, there's two X's there. The X is a fairly good sized chromosome with a lot of genes on there. Some of them are gender determining genes, but there's a lot of other important stuff on there as well such as blood clotting proteins for that. Uh, so if this was a male, then you would see a much smaller chromosome paired up with the X. So th again, this is called a karyotype. And sometimes people might get a picture of their baby's chromosomes so that they can see that there's the right amount because disorders like Down syndrome, you'll have an extra number 21. There'll be three of the, those instead of just two. So it can give you some clues as to the chromosome health of your child. Uh, adults might even get a karyotype done because there are some instances such as having a two X's and then a Y where uh, you can pretty much live a normal life, but there might be some things like sterility that come with that. So uh, a husband who's not getting his wife pregnant might get a karyotype done to see if he has an XXY situation, which would be in interfering with him making uh, viable sperm. So that's what a karyotype looks like. And then on the next slide, I have another picture of a karyotype. A karyotype is a picture of your chromosomes. And this one is the karyotype of a male. And this one is a little bit more realistic looking or maybe a little more uh, vintage looking than uh, this picture back here with the pretty colors. But you can see them all lined up and then this one has an X and a Y at the end. Here's what a mitotic chromosome looks like. A chromosome that is ready to be divided in half to separate the sister chromatids. So remember that this is a duplicated chromosome, so each side is called a chromatid, and then together they're called sister chromatids, and they will be pulled apart upon cell division. So now let's talk about the cell cycle. Oops, so by the end of this section, we should be able to describe the stages of what's called interphase, discuss the behavior of chromosomes during mitosis, and how the cytoplasmic content divides during cytokinesis, define what's called the uh, G0 phase, and explain how the three internal control checkpoints occur at the end of G1, the G2M transition, and during metaphase. All right, and we'll be referring back to this diagram a number of times. Um, it's also on the next slide as well. And our caption is telling us how a cell actually moves through its cycle. The process of cell division reproduction is just this little slice of the pie here where we see mitosis and cytokinesis, which makes up what's called the mitotic phase. That's just a small portion of a cell's average life cycle. Most of a cell's life cycle is actually spent in what's called interphase. So that's going all the way around here. And then these inside descriptions tell us a little bit about what's happening during each of the phases of interphase until we finally get to the M phase or the mitotic phase when our cell is ready to divide. So about 90% of a cell's life cycle is in interphase, going all the way around. This is when a cell is doing its everyday job that it's supposed to be doing, and there's other things going on that are pretty normal, such as producing RNA in the nucleolus, and uh, synthesizing proteins and enzymes, preparing for duplication, if that should happen to be 
triggered or signaled. And interphase then is divided into three parts or three sections, G1 synthesis and G2. And we can see those in this picture here. Here's G1 that comes first, then S, and then G2, and then finally we would reach the mitosis phase or the M phase. So a little bit about each of those phases of interphase. So normally our uh, nucleus of our cell would be very well defined. Uh, DNA would be inside the nucleus if we're talking a eukaryotic cell, uh, but we wouldn't see chromosomes just yet. It's, remember my spaghetti and meatballs comparison? At this point, the DNA would kind of look like spaghetti, and then the histone proteins would look like meatballs, and we wouldn't see our DNA wrapped around those proteins yet. So in this phase, the DNA, along with its proteins, is called chromatin at this point in the nucleus. And that's during interphase. So interphase is divided into three phases. First of all, the G1 phase. This is called gap one or growth one phase. Again, a cell is doing its everyday job and it's growing. Again, here we see our G1 phase right here and we're reminded in the middle that that is basic cell growth. Then we reach the S phase of the cell cycle and that's short for synthesis because that's when the cell gets a signal that mitosis is kind of coming up not too long from now. So it gets a, a chemical signal to start duplicating or synthesizing DNA. So this is when those chromosomes are copied. So if you uh, go back and picture our chromosome here, if it would just have, a, here we go, one side, it would go from looking like this in this picture here, this one blue one, to now it is sister chromatids attached because it has been copied. Same thing with the purple one or the pink one. Now it's sister chromatids. So this would happen during the S phase of the cell cycle. And then finally, G2 or the second gap or growth phase. This is when cell division is coming up, so the cell needs to get prepared for that. So the cell grows bigger, it produces more organelles, more proteins, more membrane material, everything it's going to need to get it through cell division and then have enough stuff for when there's one cell going to two daughter cells. Again, G2 looks like this right here, and in the middle we're reminded that that's extra cell growth and getting ready for cell division. Then we have the M phase, and that's mitosis. So again, that's just a small portion of the whole pie. That's when the cell is actually going to be actively dividing into two daughter cells. Uh, the mitosis part of it is when the nucleus divides and pulling the chromosomes apart. And then another process called cytokinesis occurs. That's when the cytoplasm finishes up the M cycle and divides. And all of this is to ensure that our daughter cells are gonna have the full genome of information to be able to uh, have successful life functions. It's gonna have the traits which come from the DNA that it needs to survive to build the organism. The M phase is actually divided into four phases and they're uh, easily recognizable by looking at what the chromosomes are doing during that time. So uh, to help me remember this, I think PMAT using the first letter from each word, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, think PMAT. What's a puppy need? A PMAT. A good easy way to remember that. So let's talk about each of those four metaphase phases. Starting with prophase, if I were to look under a microscope at a cell that is entering prophase, I would see the chromatin 
That's the strands of DNA starting to condense. And that means that the DNA is wrapping itself around those histone, histone proteins and becoming very visible. And uh, the centrioles, those are the cell organelles that look like little uh, spindles that are going to be involved with uh, setting up what's called the mitotic spindle. Those will move to opposite poles of the cell. You're going to start to see those moving in an animal cell. At least plant cells are a little different. Protein fibers kind of start to set up into it almost kind of looks like a spider web called the mitotic spindle. And these are, are consisting of the different kind of protein fibers like microtubules, which contain actin and myosin, which are contractile proteins. And that action of contracting is what's going to help move the chromosomes apart from one another and split the nucleus apart. And then, of course, the whole cell apart. So our mitotic spindle and the cent together with the centrioles are going to help pull the cell apart. The nucleolus disappears and the nuclear membrane breaks down during prophase. So all of that very visible under a microscope, even a, a regular uh, light microscope that you might use in a high school classroom or a college uh, lab. Then we enter, this is my favorite phase because it's the easiest one to see under a microscope. It's called metaphase. And some books will divide metaphase into these two. There's a pro-metaphase and a metaphase. Sometimes I just combine them. One's just a little earlier than the other. Pro-metaphase is when there's a transition going from prophase to metaphase, where you start to see the spindle fibers attaching to the centromeres of the chromosomes themselves and starting to move those chromosomes to the middle or the equator of the cell. And then finally, when you see those chromosomes actually get right to the middle or the equator of the cell, that's called metaphase right there. And that's very visible under a microscope because all your chromosomes are lined up single file across the middle of the cell. That's called the metaphase or metaphasal plate. Metaphase, meta means middle. Our spindle fibers are coordinating that movement and this is going to help ensure if we get our chromosomes lined up right in the middle, that means the sister chromatids are on opposite sides of the equator. We're going to be able to pull them apart like we should, and the sister chromatids will move away from one another, and we'll get the right amount of chromosomes in our daughter cells, which for a human, we only want 46. Next, we come to anaphase, and this is also very visible under a microscope. The sister chromos chromatids are going to separate from one another at what's called the kinetochores. Let's see if I have a picture of that at all. Anyway, the kinetochores are little protein fibers that are kind of like, think of them as protein spikes that are coming off of the centromere in the middle of the chromosome. And that's where we're going to attach the spindle to and start pulling those sister chromatids apart, moving them to opposite poles. And basically the little motor proteins, the actin and myosin, are contracting and kind of walking along that spindle. If you kind of think of it like this, how they're walking like my fingers are doing, until they get to the opposite poles. This, of course, is going to take ATP from the mitochondria to do this. And then our poles will start to move farther apart from one another. In anaphase, the proteins holding together, the sister chromatids are inactivated, which allows them to be uh, more easily pulled apart that way and become their individual chromosomes. So think for anaphase, think away or apart. Telophase, we're almost done with metaphase when we hit telophase, or excuse me, we're almost done with mitosis when we hit telophase. This is when we'd see the daughter nuclei form, the nucleolus 
forms again or reforms and our chromosomes disperse and kind of start unwinding. The DNA unwinds from those histone proteins to again look like spaghetti and meatballs. The mitotic spindle also breaks down and those spindle fibers disperse back to being part of the cytoskeleton of the cell. And cytokinesis, that's the division of the cytoplasm that commences. And basically, if you're looking at an animal cell, think of like a belt around the middle of the animal cell, and then you cinch it until you cinch the cell in half. That's what cytokinesis looks like, like a constriction belt of actin, little contractile microfilaments around the equator of the cell that helps to divide that cell into a cleavage furrow forms that's like the cinching of the belt in plant cells it's a little bit different remember plant cells have that cell wall so basically you don't have cytokinesis like you do in the animal cells a cell plate forms in the middle of the two daughter cells and vesicles basically made of membrane material come from the golgi and then line up to divide the cell and then the vesicles fuse to make each cell its very own cell membrane then a new cell wall is laid down between the membranes and so your textbook comes with this diagram here that shows you pictures of the different phases of the cell from prophase. They do include the prometaphase, the metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis of what that looks like with some information underneath to remind you for review of what actually happens during each of those phases. Move my picture out of the way. And then here's what a picture of cytokinesis looks like in an animal cell, what we mean by the cleavage furrow and the contractile ring of actin filaments here, dividing our cell in two. And then here's our plant cell with vesicles from the Golgi being laid down in between the two daughter cells, fusing each cell has, has its own membrane now, and then the cell wall is laid down between them. So how is all of this controlled? Well, first, do all cells have the same cell cycle? The answer to that is no. Think about the different jobs that cells have. Like an embryo, its job is to grow. So basically, its cell cycle is very quick, 20 minutes, almost as quick as bacteria, dividing every 20 minutes going through mitosis where skin cells maybe every day or so, every 12 to 24 hours to replace that dead layer on top. Liver cells can kind of go back and forth. They can return, retain the ability to divide, but they can slow it way down as well, dividing every one, once every year or two, and sometimes not much at all. There's a phase called G0 where a cell is kind of arrested into not being able to divide. Liver cells can go into G0 but can come out of it. But some mature adult cells can't. Once they're in G0, they're pretty much in G0 and they have like arrested uh, cell division. They can't do it at all. So mature nerve cells, muscle cells, heart cells are good examples of cells that permanently don't really divide. They're in G0. So what controls the cell cycle? They're called checkpoints. And basically, they're run by proteins and chemicals that are in the cell. If there's the right amount of chemicals or proteins, then a cell might get a stop or a go signal that they're, uh, that they're supposed to get to bring it through the cell cycle. And these are at critical points. And basically, having the right amount of chemicals and proteins can be a signal that key processes have been completed correctly in the cell. So it's okay to go to the next phase, whether it be going from a, 
a G1 to an S phase or a S phase to a G2 or a G2 to M. So there's three major checkpoints. Probably one of the most important is the G1 phase. It's called the restriction checkpoint. It's so important it gets its own name. And basically what the cell can kind of ask itself is, can DNA synthesis safely begin? Are there the right amount of proteins and chemicals? Is the cell the right size? Is there enough organelles and all that other stuff that we can support synthesizing DNA? Because if we move from G1 to S, that means we're going to start synthesizing DNA. So that is a very important checkpoint right there for the restriction checkpoint. The G2 checkpoint right at the end of G2, that means we've already gone through S, we've gone through most of G2, and well now on the horizon is mitosis coming up. So we have to ask ourselves, okay, uh, did the DNA get synthesized correctly? Are there a lot of mutations, wrong numbers of chromosomes, and all of that? If not, then we better not divide this cell. Because if we divide a cell that doesn't have the right amount of DNA, chromosomes, has too many mutations, it could become a cancerous cell. It could become a problem cell. So a cell could be arrested if it doesn't have the right uh, DNA synthesis. If it gets the go-ahead signal, then it's going to commit to mitosis. So then in the M phase, there's actually one more checkpoint. And it's right there in a metaphase, right before anaphase takes place. And we uh, split our chromosomes apart. Because once we start anaphase, when we start splitting our chromosomes, they're the sister chromatids from one another, we can't stop that. So we better make sure before we go ahead. So at our, our spindle checkpoint, our M checkpoint, the cell checks to see that all of our chromosomes are connected to the mitotic spindle and are going to be separated properly. So our next slides will talk about each of those. So we'll do a quick little review. The uh, G1 again is the most critical. It's the restriction checkpoint. If a cell receives the go signal, it will divide probably because uh, that's such an important uh, part of our cell cycle. Not always, but generally if the restriction checkpoint gets the go-ahead, then our cell probably will complete all of the other checkpoints as well. Here's the questions the cell is asking. Is the cell the right size? Is there enough nutrition, enough protein signals, growth factors, and things like that? Because if we commit, then we're going to go into the S phase and copy our DNA. If a cell does not receive the signal, it can exit this and switch to a G0 phase, meaning it'd be a non-dividing, but just a working state. The cell can still live, can still work, but we're not going to allow it to divide because of certain problems that it has. We don't want its problems passed on to any of its offspring or daughter cells. It can go into G0, but it in liver cells, they can be called back. As I said before, liver cells can go in and out of G0. And nerve and muscle cells, like heart cells, basically are arrested in G0 and never divide. So here's a little depiction of what G0 might look like if we added that to our picture of our cell cycle. On this picture, you could use this picture as a, to kind of quiz yourself what happens during each of these phases, and you could write those in if you wanted. A little tip there. Uh, how do cells know when to divide? Well, it's all about chemical signals, the proteins. Proteins can act as activators, inhibitors. Some very special uh, proteins are called CDK proteins. They uh, seem to help regulate cell division when present. So uh, very important proteins that are part of the signals for cell division. So let's talk about, well, what happens when a cell 
does not listen to the cell cycle when it goes through its checkpoints, kind of becomes rogue and does its own thing. That's called cancer. And it's caused by a cell that does not listen to its cell cycle, that does not heed its checkpoints. So we'll explain how cancer is caused by uncontrolled cell division, how proto-oncogenes are actually normal cell genes, but when they get mutated, they become bad, or what are called oncogenes. Describe how tumor suppressor function to stop the cell cycle until certain events are completed, and explain how mutant tumor suppressors cause cancer. All right, so let's talk about these genes here. So growth factors can create cancers. Um, we have genes that are called proto-oncogenes. Those are normal genes that activate cell division. They cause the making of proteins that give a kind of a positive go-ahead for cell division in the cell. But if they were to get mutated, that could be bad. Then they become what are called oncogenes. And they can become switched on permanently. So proto-oncogenes, they're great. They cause cell division, but we don't want cells to just continue, continue to divide unchecked. We want them to stop when they're supposed to. So a mutated proto-oncogene can do just that. It can create too many proteins that make a cell want to keep going through cell division. So there's a specific gene, they've called it RAS, R-A-S for short, and it activates those cyclins, those proteins that we just talked about that cause a cell to keep wanting to go through division over and over again like a cancer cell would. It can cause a cell to become cancerous. But just because a cell has a mutated proto-oncogenes, doesn't necessarily mean that cell will become cancerous because there's other backups in place besides the proto-oncogenes. We also have tumor suppressor genes which code for negative regulator proteins that stop cell division. So uh, it's kind of a give and take again where that, uh, yeah, we want uh, cells to go through division, but not too much. So then we have these that can stop it and slow it down when it should. But unfortunately, these genes, tumor suppressor genes, can become mutated as well. And instead of inhibiting uh, cell division, they be, they're not able to uh, stop anything. They get switched off permanently, and that can cause cells to become cancerous. In fact, uh, there's a specific gene called the p53 gene that's pretty much identified in most uh, human cancers, or at least half of them that they're not working, that these tumor suppressor genes don't work, so there's nothing to stop the cell from going rogue and going through cell division continually. When a cell becomes cancerous, we say it's transformed. That cell is now transformed and it's not going to listen to checkpoints and it's going to keep going through divisions with those oncogenes, with no tumor suppressor genes to stop it. So basically these mutations have happened and our cell is now transformed and could possibly become cancerous or create a tumor. So cancer is essentially a failure of cell division control with unrestrained, uncontrolled cell growth. That the cell is not listening to those very important uh, checkpoints that are there for a purpose. So what control is lost, the checkpoint stops, the oncogenes make the cell push right past those checkpoints, kind of like not stopping for the stop sign. Too many proteins are created that are pro-cell division, it keeps going through divisions. And if the gene P53 is not working, the tumor suppressor genes are not working, then there's nothing to stop it. A P53 protein would normally halt the cell division if it would detect something wrong with the cell, such as damaged DNA. There are some options if genes are working, like the P53 gene is working, making the correct proteins. It could stimulate repair 
to fix the DNA, or it could force that cell into G0, or arrest it in G1 and make it into a non-dividing cell, or worst case scenario for the cell, it could cause that cell to basically commit suicide and die by uh, releasing its lysosome enzymes and then killing it, which then destroys the damaged cell so that it doesn't divide and then make its offspring, uh, make more offspring like it to make it grow into a tumor. So there are some options that uh, for a cell with, if it's transformed, but uh, all cancers have to shut down that p53 tumor suppressor gene activity in order to become transformed. So um, mutations can build up in a cell that can lead to this transformation or cancer. And it uh, basically takes what we call hits or mutations, six key ones. So basically you've got to uh, mutate those proto-oncogenes, make them into oncogenes, so that cell division is turned on permanently. You've got all of these proteins that are pro-division. You've got to shut off the tumor suppressor gene, shut down P53, mutate that one then there's nothing to stop those oncogenes. A cell has to be able to also escape apoptosis. That's the cell suicide where it kills itself by releasing its, en its lysosome enzymes. So we got to turn those off and not listen to that signal. If a cell were to get that signal to do that, it would have to not listen to it. Then you need uh, the ability to divide again and again and again, which actually wears on the chromosomes to some extent. So it has to be able to create enzymes to repair its chromosomes after every division. And uh, if that's a big area of research. If you can find a way to... Uh, uh, find enzymes for us to do that. Uh, that could be a big money maker for the future or for big pharmacies. A dividing cell or a tumor needs a lot of nutrients. So the only way to get those nutrients is to have a nice blood vessel growth around you to be able to bring those nutrients to you. So if you uh, ever see tumors, often you'll see huge blood vessel growth around those tumors, just delivering nutrients like crazy. So a, a tumor needs to be able to turn on blood vessel growth genes to be able to feed itself. And um, cells also have to ignore what's around them because often cells will stop growing if they're being touched on all sides of themselves, then they know there's enough of them. But in this case, if it's a cancerous cell, it doesn't care. It'll just keep growing, even though it's in a crowded area. It just keeps growing and growing, which then pushes into other organs or breaks off and uh, it goes through the bloodstream or lymph vessels to other places. It has to overcome anchor and density dependence. So basically, it doesn't have to be anchored to anything. It can be free-floating and doesn't worry about being touched around itself. It'll still grow anyway. So those are some six key mutations that will affect a cancerous cell. So what causes these mutations? Well, here's a, a short list. UV radiation, chemical and radiation exposures, heat, cigarette smoke, pollution, age, genetics. Can you think of more? Think of how uh, the older you get, your risk of cancer increases. That's because over your lifetime, you become exposed to more and more of these, these mu things that cause mutations in your cells. And over time, those mutations can build up, which is kind of scary. Uh, in a benign tumor, these are abnormal cells that will remain at the original site as a lump but the P53 tumor suppressor gene is still working, so it's halted the cell divisions like it caught it in time. And most of these don't cause any problems. They may be removed by surgery. A malignant tumor, though, 
this is where it is very cancerous cells leave the site they grow uh, if they leave and go to other areas that's called metastasis it can be carried by the blood and lymph system and then those cells can grow and push into other organs and tissues and then impair the functions of those throughout the body there's different treatments and all the time that uh, that is growing so high energy radiation which kills rapidly dividing cells chemotherapy which is drug therapy that stops dna replication especially in fast growing cells stops mitosis cytokinesis stops blood vessel growth there's new drugs out there with uh, different uh, proteins or enzymes that are found only in cancer cells that or that target those proteins found only in cancer cells new treatments that work on destroying blood vessel growth around tumors to starve them new treatments to train your own cells to uh, destroy the cancerous cells and more do some research and you'll find more and more treatments and how uh, treatments of cancer are becoming more and more personalized to the individual and then we have some final diagrams here looking at normal p53 and mutated p53 which the mutated then can cause the cells to become cancerous if there's enough other mutations And then I did mention binary fission at the beginning of the lecture, which is when a prokaryote goes through division. In multicelled organisms, we call it mitosis, but in prokaryotes and other some other like protists, single-celled organisms, we call it binary fission instead. So you can check out that diagram as well. As usual, when we get to the end of the chapter. I recommend looking through the questions and trying to be able to answer those. Some are more essay questions. Some are more on the order of multiple choice. So check those out. And there's a few more here. All right. I hope you enjoyed learning about cell reproduction. Let me know if you have any questions.